we're delighted to bring this session to you today about creative, creative research methodologies in open distance and online learning. We have two very interesting speakers lined up. Uh, Rima al -Tawil, Dr. Rima al -Tawil from Athabasca University in Canada and Dr. Melissa Bond from UCL, University College London. I, I, I've tried, I think I'm getting it right. So Rima, Rima is going to get started now in a moment. Rima, if you want to get your slides and things ready, you should hopefully have host. And I'm just going to read your biography, which is a nice short biography, thankfully. So Dr. Rima al Tawil is a distinguished educator and researcher specializing in distance education with a particular focus on electronic nonverbal cues or ENVC in online learning environments holding a doctorate in education from Athabasca University and a master's in adult education. Her work delves into the underexplored world of nonverbal communication in asynchronous online discussions. I'm not going to read the rest, Reem, I hope you don't mind. There's some other very nice details. One thing I would say is that you should check out, Rima has a very good article in a Rodal based on her master's thesis around ENVC, which is well worth a read and hopefully several forthcoming articles uh, about her doctoral work, I hope. Okay, Rima, over to you. Okay, Welcome. thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I didn't expect you to read any, but I welcome any questions afterwards. I'll keep this short. I know we have like 20 minutes or so, but I'll try to keep it as short as we can so that we can have more uh, questions. So welcome everybody to this Creative Research Methodologies webinar. Uh, for today, I'm very excited to talk to you about uh, my recent research. But first, we will discuss a little bit of uh, our thoughts on creativity and academic research. Then I will discuss my research methodological approach. We'll talk about the creativity and the challenges that I faced while doing so, while maintaining rigor. Uh, in academic studies, and then I will discuss how this impacted the research outcome without going into details at all. But before we do so, let's discuss the word creativity, because this can mean a lot of things to many people. So when we say creativity, what words come to mind? I know we are uh, probably all muted, but if anybody wants to raise their hand and tell us what imagery also comes to mind, that's totally fine. But probably you can start by writing in the chat what words come to your mind when you think about the word creativity. And probably this is why you were interested in attending this webinar today. I can see some interesting words so far. Liber liberté, I saw it in French, imagination, new originality, divergent thinking, produce something new, freedom, which is liberté as well, and freedom, out of the box, that's interesting, out of the box, I find it, it's a very interesting terminology that we use for creative thinking when we're talking about problem solving as well, finding a feature not seen before, new ways to produce or think or thinking freely. All these are interesting, very interesting. I don't know if this feature is uh, open to everybody or not. Can people do some reactions here, especially the green check mark and the red X. So if you can just like confirm for me because I organized this so that we can see, we can get a quick poll here, uh, but I'll continue to read innovation. Okay, original, using your imagination, aesthetics, processes. Great, excellent. Okay, so in your opinion, I didn't see anybody say anything about art. <laughs> so is creativity closely connected to artistic expression since nobody mentioned it? I was hoping if you go to the bottom, you can put either a quick check mark or a red X, but if you can do that, probably you can just like yes or no in the chat since I'm monitoring it. 
being the center of everyone's attention, we don't have the reactions. Okay, I can see X or check mark or just say yes or no. Uh, okay, some people are saying yes closely, but not mainly. Okay, sometimes like that's a positive answer. Partly, yes. Yes, but not exclusively. I like that. So this begs another question. If creativity is connected to artistic expressions, can academic research be creative while maintaining rigor? Let's see. Yes, some people are saying yes. I was very, very curious about this question to the point that I went to ChatGPT yesterday and I put this exact same question. I wanted to see what's, uh, what's the prevalent notion about this topic since ChatGPT and all AI brings information from all over the, the internet. So I asked ChatGPT about this question. Can rigorous academic research be creative? And funny enough, it gave me this answer. Creativity and academic research is not about artistic expression. I didn't say anything about art, but Chad GPT mentioned it immediately. I wanted to confirm. I wanted to make sure that I, like Chad GPT is understanding my question because I didn't say anything about art. So I asked again, did you say that creativity and academic research is not about artistic expression? And ChatGPT answered very, very strong affirmative. Yes, I mentioned that creativity and academic research typically differs from artistic expression. And continued to explain to me that research, academic research focuses on innovative thinking, as you mentioned, most of you here, and this type of creativity is more about intellectual innovation and the advancement of knowledge. Uh, well, this is very interesting. I found it very interesting because that's what everybody thinks, right? Uh, but what about people who are intuitively artistic? And they are also learners and educators and involved in educational research. Does this mean that they have to put their artistic creativity on the side as they engage in educational research? This, this question is very important for me because I am intuitively artistic. I studied art, I worked in art, I taught art, but I'm also an educator. I'm also a teacher. I'm also an instructor. And I am an educational researcher. And when I started getting involved in research, like everybody here and ChatGPT, what ChatGPT mentioned, I thought that I have to put my artistic side, my artistic spirit on this side because it doesn't have a place in the scholarly world. And it's exactly this notion that I am here to challenge because of my last experience with research. So my last research, the one that I just finished for my dissertation was entitled ENVC and Deeper Learning. Orna mentioned that ENVC is a, an acronym for electronic nonverbal cues that I wrote about before and I continue to explore. But this time I explored it through a different lens. I explored it through the lens of orthography. That is a methodology that I will talk about in a bit. And I naturally gravitated to this methodology because of my artistic spirit. And when I did that, I came to realize that the integration of artistic ways of knowing can lead to a deeper, more nuanced understanding, making the education and educational research not only more comprehensive, but also more human-centric. Therefore, in a way or another, rehumanizing it. My research, like any other research, started with some research questions. At the time, my intention was not 
to include art or orthography in it. As you can see, my research questions meant to explore aspects of ENVC that contribute towards interaction and engagement that lead to deeper learning in asynchronous discussion-based courses. I was very interested in that during the time of, at the beginning of my research in 2019 <laughs> because of COVID-19 and how people were more into Zoom and having synchronous sessions while asynchronous sessions are known to be very uh, um, useful for deeper learning and reflection. Of course, I had some sub-questions, but also I meant to uh, inform practice. So this is the rigor, right? Like I conducted research so that we can come up with some recommendations. But while researching and doing my literature review, I came across some notions in the literature about nonverbal communication, which compare it to a tapestry, where they say the verbal and nonverbal uh, cues are inextricably intertwined like strands in a tapestry. Now, this is not unusual, right? Like the metaphor of weaving and the metaphor of tapestry are widely used everywhere, but particularly in education. And it's not unusual for somebody to adopt a guiding metaphor for their research. But what I decided to do after researching weaving and trying to understand what weaving is based on my artistic creative side, I decided to enter this research as a researcher weaver and a deeper learner, which means I decided to weave an actual tapestry. And that is the tapestry that you see right here behind me. And this is some of the strands that I used while weaving it. Uh, as a deeper learner, because I don't know how to weave. I'm an artist, I do art, I'm creative in that aspect, but I do not know how to weave. So I wanted to, to try to teach myself how to weave. Uh, this decision allowed me to bring my whole self, my entire identity as an artist, researcher, and teacher into this scholarly work. By doing so, I found myself adopting a methodology that's called orthography. Originally, it's written with uh, forward slashes, A, forward slash, R, forward slash, and tography, uh, which means the A for artist, the R for researcher, and the T for teacher. But I removed those slashes because for me, it was just a holistic approach. I entered it as one identity that has multiple dimensions or aspects. Uh, as implied by its name, I will explain a little bit about it if you aren't familiar with it. Artography uh, combines two aspects, the art and the graphy. Therefore, it merges the artistic side with the writing side while conducting research, enabling the integration of creative expressions into academic exploration. Something that we said may not happen, but there is a methodology that says, it can be done, especially in education. So in my research, how was this enacted? While art was expressed through the weaving and different forms of art that I'm going to talk about in a bit, graphy was incorporated through narrative methods and poetic inquiry as well. And narrative methods is something that I wanted to adopt at the beginning of my research. So I, that's why I had six participants. I collaborated with six participants. We partnered together so that we can gather their narratives. And uh, together we worked on uh, weaving them into the tapestry as well. Orthography is rhizomatic, relational, and reflexive by nature. Therefore, it fosters critical introspection individually and collectively. That's why I collaborated with the participants. In my study, it involved an ongoing weaving in the literal sense of self-knowledge, relational knowledge, and new understanding. 
this was not metaphorical only. It was an actual weaving. So when I started weaving, I started seeing the parallelism between the actions that I was doing with my senses tangibly and the process of conducting my research. For example, the first step for me to weave was to learn about looms and to decide how to buy a loom and then learn about threads that I was going to use to warp the loom. So as you can see here in the picture, I was just like warping the loom. But warping the loom was involved a lot of turning back and forth like this while moving, progressing. So inspired by this action, I envisioned the research design as a wavy roadmap. This is what you are seeing here, where the boundaries between data gathering, interpretation, and analysis were vaguely defined, where I could move up and down, if you want, uh, within the research, doing this and then doing that at the same time. Uh, this brief explanation that you can see also to the left bottom of this uh, slide is only to represent this iterative process. So instead of going like one step after another, I knew what I was doing. So I would go, for example, for data gathering, I had step number one, step number two, and step number seven, going back and forth along the lines of these. So in um, that's why, as I said, I collaborated with six participants where our collaboration started before the data gathering and continued right after, but there was only one session of data gathering that I held uh, uh, one formal session that we recorded and we held over Zoom. Uh, how did the weaving happen? The weaving happened when I recorded this uh, the, the, their narratives, and I started listening to them while trying to weave their stories into that uh, tapestry. So I was weaving their stories and mine into the tapestry. I just want to mention one thing, and that is creativity wasn't all fun, fun, fun for me. It was a lot of hard work. So one of the things that I found extremely challenging before I started reaching that stage of creativity was doing all the tedious work, like installing the shedding device or tying those tiny little ropes that you can see, which we call heddles. I had to tie 320 of these. While doing that, as I said, I saw a parallelism with all the the hard work that we do while conducting research, like something that I don't really like, like conducting literature review and reading a lot and trying to put all this together. It's necessary for a structurally sound dissertation and research and tapestry. Like all any research requires a lot of hard work. Creativity doesn't just come like that. So I learned this. It wasn't all fun. But once I had this done, I also learned that I can't just like create from nothing. Creating a tapestry from nothing, it's like doing a research from nothing is not feasible. It might be romantic at the time I thought I could do it, but then later on I discovered that I cannot do it without a prior design. So I used my artistic skills and I used fresco. Uh, a tool from Adobe Suite to create the original design on my computer. And then I printed it out and I put it behind my tapestry based on the narratives. Of course, the design was created and it inspired the palette and I started weaving as well. So if you look at that picture here, the narratives, I saw the narratives and the stories as the fringe threads, which these threads, they were so distinct, so separate and one next to the other. But when I started interweaving them, they evolved into a multitude of shades and shapes that invited a lot of reflection and meaning making for me. While doing that, it was very, very difficult for me as well because it took a lot of time. And I was doing this while conducting a research, doing it creatively, 
I kept also a reflexive journal, writing what I was feeling, what I was experiencing. There was a time when I felt that it was nice, and I'm inviting you here to my to some of the expressions that I wrote in my reflexive journal. But like any deeper learner, I started doubting myself and thinking, I can never do it. Why did I do it? So again, creativity is not always fun. Maybe I should just leave it and focus on conducting the research and the writing. Again, orthography involves the art of making and the writing. So I was tempted to leave the making part of it. Uh, but then I kept pushing forward until I reached the stage when it became a part of my identity and I couldn't stop doing it at all. This is when I started feeling the learning evolve. So through this act of making, of creating, I started understanding my topic. After engaging in something that I called story hearing and story weaving, I spent six months doing that. I came to actually transcribe in words those narratives while keeping the journaling. And I started storying and restorying. While storying and restorying, my aim was to condense those narratives while remaining very faithful to the words that the participants uttered. I, I kept their words during the restoring. To do that, I also engaged in a different artistic expression and creative expression, and that is through poetry. So I wrote some something that I called found poems, where I used their transcripts to write some poems using their own words. All the participants, that's what I'm talking about right now, remaining rigorous. Creativity didn't keep me away from conducting scholarly, rigorous, academic research. So while doing that, I remain very faithful to the original data, their own and mine. I did lots of member checking with them. As I said, even when I created the found poems by using their own words, I kept checking with them to make sure that they approve and this exactly represents their wording. I honored their voices by representing parts of their narratives in the first person. And by doing so, I felt that I created a sphere of meaning making where participants, myself as a researcher weaver, and all the readers who are going to read my research meet each other in this virtual space where we share meaning. And by representing those narratives in the first person, I also gave the freedom. And this also was creative. I felt it was creative for me because I gave the, the freedom to the readers to draw their own interpretations. After I analyzed the data, and I don't want to tell you, but I will just mention that it was a very, very uh, rigorous process. Everything that I would do for a normal research, I did it three times more. For example, if I would code one time, I coded it three times for this research. And if I would transcribe once, I transcribed three times. Like everything was multiplied by three. But once I did all my data analysis and, uh, and interpretation, I overlaid, I kind of like looked at the data analysis through the perspective of weaving. And when I combined the art and the graphy, few themes emerged. And those themes, I'm going to share them very, very briefly here with you, and you see how I was inspired through the art. I represent them in this visual, and I'm going to talk about them very, very briefly, as I said. In this visual, you see that at the heart of these themes is an inverted question mark. This inverted question mark is very intentional because it reflects something about my heritage as a Lebanese person speaking Arabic. And 
this is how we write in Arabic. We write from right to left. And doing the weaving helped me connect with my own identity as a bilingual and multiple multinational Arabic Canadian researcher who naturally processes information, written information from right to left and from left to right. When I was weaving, I was moving the threads from right to left and from left to right. And I noticed that there are some insights that I can glean from this back and forth going in opposite directions. While reflecting on this, I also understood a little bit about those asynchronous discussions and this dynamic dialoguing where we go to and fro. And again, is the word again refers to the temporal aspect, which is connected to an ENVC subcategory related to time. We call it chronemics. So just putting all these together, I also understood that we need to take time and space away through what we call past continuity. This was also inspired by my creation of the tapestry because in the tapestry, although everything looks as a whole, this is made of several separate threads, but they are all interconnected. So there are pauses, but those pauses do not affect continuity. And those pauses, I inspired, like those pauses inspired me to bring an aspect from art, which is the negative space. Negative space is a term that I also borrow from art. It represents these pauses or gaps that are essential for reflection and they happen in time. These are like small silences like this little silence that I introduced here and I experienced it through my weaving where I left parts without weaving but everybody could identify what the shape is like the shape of that person growing over there because of everything that's around it so that's what I mean by negative space but we need to pay attention because in asynchronous discussions, a negative space, if it's long, too long, it can affect interaction. And of course, I'm not going to talk about all the other themes because I am being very sensitive to the time, but I can talk about them later on if I asked. In addition to these themes, I came up with a lot of findings that do not affect also that that is the outcome of my research. So the weaving and the art and the creativity was in, for inspiration, but the outcome was about some knowledge, some awareness about ENVC, of course, and many recommendations at several levels for educational institutions or programs, course design, course instruction and facilitation and learners on the understanding and use of ENVC in asynchronous discussions. And I'm going to stop here. Uh, and I would say thank you so much for listening to me for this long rambling about my research and my creative approach. And I would welcome any questions if we have any. Thanks, Rima. And if you haven't noticed folks in the background, that's the tapestry Rima has been describing, her dissertation tapestry. Um, so yeah, we do have a few minutes for questions. If anyone wants to ask, you can pop one in the chat. Q&A, if you put up your hand, I'll, I'll allow you to, um, I'll give you, give you the mic. Um, it's a very interesting approach, artography. Jackie has her hand up. Let me see if I can give you the mic, Jackie. So hopefully Jackie can take the mic. And I will stop sharing if Jackie wants to also. Yeah, that's uh... great, yeah, Rima, go okay. ahead. So Jackie. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, thanks, Rima. That was fascinating. i um, really interested in this area because I'm hoping to do something creative in my own um, dissertation. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, what did the um, weaving bring? Because I noticed that you did the um, artwork that you drew, you know, you painted the picture, which was your design. And with doing the weaving, um, was it the process that sort of brought more information? Because the painting would have brought some information, presumably, as well. 
That's a very good question, Jackie. And to be honest with you, I was tempted not to weave and just to use that digital representation. What I learned through the weaving is totally different from what I did in the digital design. First of all, let me mention that the weaving did not, was inspired from the digital design, but it was not a, a faithful representation of the digital design. Uh, what I learned through weaving is a deeper understanding of the building up of knowledge over time. And that's what I came uh, and that inspired one of my themes, which I called layered, uh, layered growth. Uh, layered growth and that is uh, because when we draw or when we paint I can take my brush even digitally and I can draw a line or I can draw a shape whereas when I am weaving I'm just weaving one row at a time so if it's red yellow red it's red yellow red and then yellow red like you know and it starts building layers uh, over time uh, this was very important for understanding the passage of time and how it impacts knowledge as well and knowledge creation and knowledge accumulation and growth. Mm, fascinating. Yeah, and I'd missed the part that the, the design, uh, the artwork was a digital. So I guess that's different from doing it by hand as well. Thanks so much. Yes, fascinating. And I, think I, I, I wanted to speed up the process. That's why I did it digitally. <laughs> There's something so interesting about how the weaving and the narrative and the kind of subjectivity of your input into both the research and the artwork combine. I just find it fascinating. And this isn't my first time hearing Rima's work at all. So thank you, Jackie, for, for, for that okay. uh, question. It was a very good one. Uh, would anyone else like to ask a question either by mic or chat? We have a few minutes after uh, at the end as well, if you've got a burning question you'd like to ask then. But if I, we've got space for another one or two, if anyone wants to. Uh, somebody asked me about the poem. If we have time, I have a video where I read the poem so I can probably play that. Uh, but or I can just say the poem if we have time. Yeah, uh, we, will. I, I we can, do that at yeah. the end, Rima. Okay, so we don't need to. No, we will. This, we will. We, I will invite everybody to get it ready. To, to it's read. beautiful. <laughs> I think I've seen part of that video. It's lovely. You know, we'll give you a few minutes to get it ready. Um, okay. I think then I'll move on to the next speaker, Melissa. If you want to prepare yourself, I'll read your introduction. Thank you so much, Rima. That was really fabulous. Um. It's such interesting work. Melissa is going to be talking about a different type of creativity in research, but but still creativity. Um, and I do think um, research is changing. Um, so and I think some of these new met methodologies also um, allow us to understand our work in a different way. So I'm very uh, pleased to welcome Dr. Melissa Bond, who is a research fellow at the Epi Center and National Institute of Teaching at UCL, as well as adjunct associate professor in qualitative evidence synthesis at the University of Stravangar. Her research focuses in particular on how evidence, evidence synthesis can build research skills, provide insight into digital teaching and learning, uh, provide guidance, policy and practice. Um, I'm just gonna not read the last few lines, Mel, if that's okay. Um, before you get started, uh, Melissa, just to highlight a couple of recent uh, works, there's a lovely um, journal article about motherhood and the doctoral journey I highly recommend uh, of M Melissa's. And I think you have a very recent AI education one, Mel, as well. Is, is, is that correct? Yes, there's, um, uh, it's just been accepted into the EJETA journal. So it's the preprints on ResearchGate, but I will be talking about it. You want to shamelessly plug those by putting any any links in the chat please go ahead and the oh. same Rima we 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 support this um so Mel over to you brilliant all right thank you so much for the invitation to uh come and present today when Orna first invited me um to present today at this creative research methodologies workshop I actually was a little bit surprised um because I don't often think about uh myself as as a, a creative researcher necessarily, but when you think about it, 
I'm an evidence synthesis and we do a lot of weaving. We weave together the stories and the research that other people have undertaken and we weave it together in order to get an understanding of the whole of a, of, of a particular phenomenon. Um, and so in that sense, uh, there is definitely an element of creativity. So today I really want to share with you, um, I guess, the broader spectrum of what evidence synthesis is. It goes beyond just systematic reviews or just meta-analyses. Uh, it encompasses so much more. And so that's really what I want to share with you today. Um, as Orna's already mentioned, um, yes, I'm based in England. I, I, I like to say where I'm based because I, people know, who know me do know that I tend to move around a little bit. Um, so at the moment I'm in, in the UK, I'm in England, uh, and I predominantly work for the FT Centre, both as a research fellow, but also as a training and support officer for the evidence synthesis software FE Reviewer. Um, I'm also working as a research fellow for the National Institute of Teaching uh, here in England. And uh, I'm also an associate professor with the University of Stavanger in Norway. Um, and those of you who've, who've heard me talk before perhaps know that I like to think of evidence synthesis as, as looking at the galaxy of evidence that exists rather than looking at, a, at, a, at one particular study, rather than looking at perhaps one star in the night sky, we're actually looking at the entire galaxy. Um, and it is important that we consider uh, the, the body of evidence that already exists um, because they, it allows us to identify those um, commonalities between research that's been published. It allows us to identify inconsistencies uh, or gaps or areas that need further, um, further insight into. And it can really help us to guide our practice um, in education, but also to inform policy development. Um, systematic reviews, and I have here what are systematic reviews and why are they important, but I prefer to use the term evidence synthesis because it is, as I said, more than just systematic reviews. So it is an approach that is generally transparent and explicit and replicable and updatable. However, there is a very broad spectrum of um, of different types of evidence synthesis. And Sutton and colleagues calls this the review family. So talking about things like, you know, your traditional sorts of narrative reviews or state of the art reviews to the meta-analyses and systematic reviews, to the reviews of reviews, um, which is sort of where I've started heading to in order to weave together the, the evidence that we have. Um, but also things like um, meta-ethnographies, um, mixed methods reviews that try and use different creative ways of bringing evidence together, realist reviews that, that do the same thing again, bringing primary and secondary research together, um, uh, as well as content analyses, spoken reviews and, and mapping reviews that can provide that insight into um, what evidence exists, where the gaps are, and perhaps what needs to be uh, to be considered. But here I would also say, Bibliometric or bibliographic reviews are also a form of evidence synthesis, and they don't necessarily appear in this traditional kind of view of what evidence synthesis is, but I think it definitely has a place and it allows us to be a little bit more creative, especially if you're like me and you're a little bit more qualitative minded in terms of your research. Um, it is a way of uh, perhaps a more uh, marrying in a way, the qualitative approaches, qualitative synthesis, with some more quantitative approaches as well. And this is a really nice overview of what bibliometric analysis is by Don Sue and colleagues. And it can include things like um, uh, citations and publication metrics. Um, so talking about things like your H index or your G indexes. Um, as well as co-citation analyses, um, co-authorship analyses, understanding um, how, for example, how authors within the field of distance education are contributing to the, um, the conversation around teaching and learning um, and how they are researching together, how they're, how they're working together and how does that 
um, uh, evidence that they're bringing together? How does their research then inform other conversations that are happening in our field? Um, but it also relates to clustering and, and developing um, uh, different types of ways of bringing that information and bringing that evidence together. And I like this uh, idea of, of putting into this um, visualization ideas of how you can use digital evidence synthesis tools to support your creative ways of synthesizing your evidence. So for example, using Fox Viewer, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit more, um, more detail shortly. But it is by starting to be brave, I guess, in a way, in terms of how I was approaching the work that I was doing um, and, and kind of joining different methods together to, to understand a particular theme, I guess is how I've been the most creative in my research. So um, this is just a, a bit of an overview of the types of evidence synthesis work that I've been doing. Um, and uh, so, uh, for example, looking at how uh, teaching and learning occurred during during the pandemic and, and using different approaches there. Um, whilst on one hand, I was using sort of systematic review approaches, I was also bringing in forms of content analysis as well to understand some of those conversations that were happening. Um, and starting to move more towards, I guess, moving away from a very narrow view of what evidence synthesis should be, um, which, you know, sometimes we hear, especially coming from the sort of health medicine disciplines, um, to what evidence synthesis could be. And for me, that is allowing me to delve deeper into a particular phenomenon, into a particular um, theme or topic, and using different methods, different ways of being able to understand how this research connects how these researchers connect and what does that tell us about the state of teaching and learning. And I wanted to, I guess, briefly uh, give you a couple of examples of, of ways that I've done that. So one of them was a content and authorship analysis of the British Journal of Educational Technology across its first 50 years. Um, and so we we're looking at um, what trends and issues were there in reported in BJET, um, how has BJET itself contributed to furthering the scholarship um, scholarship in the in our field in our field of uh, a broader field of ed tech, um, not just distance education but also face to face. To what extent has the journal reflected a focus on British scholarship? So bringing in a little bit of that um, authorship uh, um, uh, authorship analysis and. How has that authorship and co-authorship pattern, how has that then changed over time? Um, so I used a combination really of methods. I used the, um, I used Leximanta, uh, which is a computer assisted content analysis tool, um, which again, I'll, I'll provide a bit more information on shortly. I combined that with, uh, which what, what that does is, you enter into Leximanta, the software, you would put in the titles and abstracts of, um, the, the items that you're, you're exploring. So in this case, I put in the, the whole 50 years as well as the, the research in decades. And it produces concept maps, which look at the frequency and connectedness of the different concepts within the text that you've put in. And it produces these concept maps, which look like this. Um, and it gives you an idea of how, what kinds of themes and topics emerged from the information that you've put into the system. So I've done this for this particular um, article, of course, we were looking at the titles and abstracts of the, of the, um, the research articles, but I've also used this technique with, oh, let me just, hang on, let me just turn on my battery, otherwise it will run out. There we go. I've used this technique also with, um, uh, the research gap section of publications. So um, copying and pasting all of the um, uh, information about where there were, where the authors saw uh, research going in the future in terms of distance education or online learning. Um, and that gave an indication then of what sort of the, the common themes were in terms of, of perhaps where the field saw, um, saw itself going in the future. 
But this allowed this kind of uh, concept map allowed me to explore the different concepts. You know, finding out that um, uh, really there was this key focus on learning and students, um, as well as the student experience uh, with technology across those fifty years. But it also enabled me to compare the trends across the decades as well, um, and so. For example, these were the uh, trends that, that came through from the research, from the literature um, in the 2010s, um, where we saw a real rise in terms of um, online and blended learning and open educational resources, and of course, issues with learning analytics in terms of um, ethics and privacy, and uh, as we know, ongoing issues today. And because of that uh, ability to gain those insights, we were also I was also able to map those against the decades in order to see and identify which of these are, um, I guess, endemic problems that we still have today. So if we go back one slide, these were all of the um, issues that came up uh, as part of the analysis. And then these are the ones that um, we were still being experiencing in the 2010s into the, into the um, 2020s as well. So it was it was a real um, combination of um, it was a combination of the computer assisted content analysis. It was a combination of co-authorship analysis, as well as a synthesis of the content of those journal articles. And I used Epi Reviewer to be able to do that. And this is another way that we can be creative in terms of the way that we approach research in our field is the use of technology, not just as the subject of our research, but as the tool to help us to conduct that research. Um, and because of my interest in this, um, as part of a couple of uh, uh, reviews that we've done, we undertook a, recently undertook a systematic mapping review exploring the use of digital evidence synthesis tools by researchers who had themselves published some form of evidence synthesis. So to do that, we compared two different reviews that we've undertaken. We undertook one review looking at the methodological approaches to evidence synthesis in EdTech, and that's been accepted and it should be published any day now, uh, which is really exciting. And there we were exploring the quality, um, how replicable the evidence synthesis work is in the field of EdTech. And in the other, on the other hand, we also uh, undertook a um, meta review looking at research on artificial intelligence in educate in higher education, I should say, um, across the last five years. So the first review was um, a mapping review. Um, it looked at, as I said, um, uh, evidence synthesis that focused on educational technology that had an explicit method section. And that was published in either English, German, or Spanish. And we ended up with um, published between 2018 and 2023, 305 different forms of evidence synthesis. And that was actually sampled. There were a lot more published than that. But because of that, we had to then um, uh, uh, draw a sample. On the other review, um, we were also looking at the those five years, 2018 to 2023, looking at applications of AI in education and focusing on any form of evidence synthesis with a method section, but that were only published in the English language. And from there, we found 307. Now, in order to compare how digital evidence synthesis tools are being used between those two groups, um, we compared uh, the, the lists of items and found that there were 10 duplicates between the two. So we removed those in order to be able to conduct this, um, this little analysis. So we found that only 3.7% um, of researchers who uh, in that ed tech sample actually used some form of purpose built systematic review software, but that there was an interesting use of some other forms, for example, Boss Viewer um, and Atlas TI, uh, and a little bit of use of NVivo as well. But mostly they were some of your uh, more, I guess, standard digital tools like spreadsheets, reference management software, um, and so on. And it was the same with the artificial intelligence in higher education review. Although we did find some more creative uses of tools in the AI uh, sample. Um, for example, one uh, review used Boss Viewer 
who um, they put in, they did a quick search in the web of science using some, some search terms. And then they um, put the, the search results that they came up with into Fosfewer and they looked at the, the concepts that it produced and then they used those in order to construct their search string uh, for their reviews. So again, another sort of creative way of using tools that already exist to be able to support processes. In terms of the most used tools um, by review type, as I said, spreadsheets were the most used tool across both. Um, and perhaps so it's not really very surprising um, and that some people are still also using Word. But with the rise of more bibliometric, bibliographic approaches to this kind of research, we are seeing the introduction of more tools like Fosfewer. So this is an example of um, one of the reviews in our EdTech sample and how they use Vosfewer to be able to gain a, a broad understanding of the conversations happening in, um, in uh, the distance education online learning research. Um, and as you can see, it shows the interconnectedness between these different groups of um, different groups of, of, of subsections of the research. You can see over here uh, medical education um, sort of as their own kind of cluster around the online. Uh, we've got online learning here uh, and a lot of that really connected to machine learning algorithms classification, perhaps in order to understand um, how online learning is happening. So it's really, it's a very visual way of being able to see your results. Um, and it, I find it a really interesting way of being able to understand, as I've said, the, the different ways that, um, the, or the different conversations, the different findings that you can, uh, can uncover. Um, SiteSpace is another uh, tool that uh, is starting to be used a lot more. Uh, and I've got two examples to show you. Um, again, it looks at uh, co-occurrence frequencies. So this one's looking at the co-occurrence network of keywords um, from 2018 to 2023 in research that was published looking at artificial intelligence. As well, and it was interesting to see um, gender bias out here on its own, by the way, uh, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, but anyway, and, and here's another really create, I thought, creative way of being able to visualize and map um, concepts across time. So again, they used site space and they created this keyword co-occurrence time zone map. And you can you can see how different um, different uh, concepts started appearing when they started appearing across time, and um, how strong those um, those mentions were. Uh, which is another really interesting and creative way of being able to visualize research. Um, I've already mentioned Leximancer um, uh, and the way that it creates these concept maps to be able to see uh, um, uh, the way that the stories are weaving throughout the different um, concept bubbles um, and to see the semantic relationships between between those concepts. Unfortunately, it, it's not free anymore, um, which, uh, you know, it, it would be great if it was, but unfortunately it's not. There is a free trial version, um, uh, which I haven't tried, unfortunately, but it is a very cool tool. And of course, there are purpose-built systematic review software like, like Epi Reviewer that also enable you to, um, a bit like NVivo qualitative um, content analysis, um, allows you to create your own codes. It allows you to, um, create your own structures. And then from the data that you code within FU Reviewer, you're able to create things like interactive evidence and gap maps, which is another way to visualize the results of evidence synthesis. Um, and it's I, I particularly like this because it's, it's a great way of being able to share the results with a, a range of stakeholders who might be interested in the work that you're doing. Um, this is obviously a static image, but the, the real ones are interactive. Um, you are able to hover over these little bubbles and you're also able to, uh, people are able to download um, the, uh, the risk file, download the, the file of, of articles that are in there, have a look at abstracts, have a look at anything you, you input in there um, and, uh, and that's able to be hosted online. And you're able to, to create within Epi Reviewer um, something called uh, using the Epi Visualizer app. It is an openly accessible web database of all of the um, 
coding you've done in any review. Um, and what it does is it takes the data that you've coded in your review and it creates within like a minute, um, it creates this platform that is hosted on our server. Um, and it, again, it's interactive. You're able to um, conduct your own uh, frequency reports, your own cross tabulation. Um, it's another way for, for other researchers to be able to get in and explore the data, explore the work that you've been doing. And again, it's a great thing to be able to share with other stakeholders. But there are so many different tools that you could use to support work in evidence synthesis. This is a fantastic um, visual that was created by Ciaso Jimenez et al. Um, and it, it lists a whole range of different things, um, particularly auto that it contain automation, um, most of them. And they're able to assist you in being able to conduct different parts of the review process of the evidence synthesis process. And of course, we now have other new tools and I'm aware of the time, so I'm not going to take too much more time here, but um, there are other tools now that You're are good, available. Mel. Keep going. <laughs> oh, okay. For example, um, uh, chat GPT, as we know, um, or other large language models that are able to support the evidence synthesis process. Um, Connected papers, Elicit, Research Rabbit, and I've got a whole range of different things there. And I'm going to share my slides as well. I'll probably um, post them on my um, website. I'll pop my website address in the in the chat shortly, um, so that you can you can find it and you can click through. Um, but I do just want to mention ChatGPT a little bit um, because, as we know, it is uh, something that a, a lot of people have been starting to use. Now it is. It, it can be a really fantastic tool with teaching and learning, but when it comes to evidence synthesis, there are a lot of things that need to be considered as to how it can actually support the process. Something you really need to think about is the bias that has gone into any algorithm uh, or any training data um, that support is the underlying um, data for, for any algorithm. Um, and that is no less true of uh, ChatGPT when it comes to evidence synthesis. It's not a database in terms of, uh, you know, it's not an, an academic database. It is a language model. It has been trained up to a certain point. However, despite the, um, these, I guess, these caveats in terms of how you could use it, it has been showing some really interesting promise for assisting at screening stage, as well as for developing a search string and refining a search string when you first start out with your evidence synthesis project. Um, it has had limited success at the data extraction stage from the work that's been published, but I've been playing around with it as well as some colleagues and um, it, it can extract data to a certain extent from PDFs. But of course you would have to upgrade to the um, paid version um, once you import your uh, PDFs and use something like Code Interpreter, um, it can, it, as I said, it can, to an extent, extract information for you um, from, uh, from those documents. So I think it does require a lot more evaluation, formal evaluations, and, and those are starting to happen now. And I think um, I know that, for example, with Echo Reveal, we're, we're actually looking at integrating the open, open AI um, API into Echo Reveal so that it can be used alongside uh, within the, the platform that we've already got. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in, in looking at that kind, of, um, uh, that kind of use of large language models to be able to support evidence synthesis work. But don't rely on it to to do the synthesis for you. Use it as a tool, use it as an assistant. That would be the way forward, in my opinion. So some concluding thoughts. Evidence synthesis can definitely be a creative process. As much as it is, a, a it needs to be fairly, trans fairly, in most cases, it needs to be very transparent and very rigorous. Um, and you're writing out like a method your method section should be like a recipe for someone else to be able to follow. But as long as you choose um, processes and methods and are upfront and honest about what you've done and how you've done it, there are lots of different things that you can do to be able to bring together uh, or weave together the, the different stories that, that research from a whole range of different places 
can bring. It's really important that you start by exploring existing evidence synthesis so that you're not um, duplicating effort, that we try and eliminate this idea of research waste, and that you really use that as a basis for answering that so what question, that, you know, why are you doing a, a, p a new piece of evidence synthesis when all of this already exists? Use the tapestry of work that already exists in order to come up with the argument for why your work is novel and useful and required. You really need to choose, choose your own path as well. Just because someone says, oh, you should definitely do a systematic review because that's what I think you should do, it may not be right for the questions that you're wanting to have answered. You may find that, well, actually, I need to do a mapping review with a little bit of bibliometric analysis thrown in for good measure. That might be the way that you can answer the research questions that you have. Um, you really need to think about what your research questions are, what you're hoping to get out of it, and, and how then will this form of evidence synthesis answer that? As well as thinking about the technology that can help you to achieve those goals and really ask yourself, is this technology reliable for what I'm asking it and what I'm needing it to do? As I've already said, be transparent. We need to make sure that, that we are rigorous, no matter which format you choose. And above all else, you should be brave and you should trust your instincts. And as long as you are um, have a great argument for why you've chosen to do what you've done and you can back it up and you can base it on previous literature, then that is absolutely fantastic. So that's all I have to say about that right about now. Um, there is my uh, website. I will post these slides onto that um, shortly and you'll be able to access those with all of the links and there's all the references. And thank you so much for listening. That was fascinating, Mel. Thanks. I, I thought that in my head, systematic review work and evidence synthesis is very creative. Um, and, and I think you've shown that really well. Um, some of those tools are, I find, like, I'm really curious about some of those. I have a license for Lexamancer, which I've only just started playing around with. But, and the ChatGPT and the using the integration of AI, I like, there's some very exciting stuff happening. I mean, one of my students was telling me that they were using it uh, to screen articles. That, so they put, paste it in and get it to summarize and then decide whether or not to read it. Um, ah, I thought that was clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was a kind of a time shortcut, but I think the possibilities are huge. Uh, and yeah, if you get the paid one, you can input an, uh, a PDF and get a summary or get an audio version. And there's lots of hacks. Oh, yeah. So, lots of cool stuff. Thank you so much. You're welcome. What was the gender bias thing in that and that visualization? That was one thing I was wondering about. I have to go back to that because it was it was um it was looking at. It was looking at the research in artificial intelligence across the last five years. Um, and it was. If you don't know off the top of your head, it's grand. We I, can, don't we can... no, no, okay. I don't know. No, no, I don't know. No, it's just to curious. Back into that because it is fascinating. But, but you're right about the whole bias thing because the, the, the large language models are a mirror of society and all of that. Yeah. Well, I know about gender bias in general in terms of the way that data is trained for algorithms. That yeah. Um, and the way that large language models work, for example, it's looking at how closely related terms are to each other. Yeah. Um, and the probability based. Absolutely. Yeah. And and so there's, you know, ter certain terms, um, for example, when you search for boys are different from terms that will come up when, you, when you're looking at girls yeah. and how that. Yeah. Anyway, I could go on. But... No, so could I. I love this. <laughs> I, I was doing some messing last week to, to shine a light on that exact issue. And I put in the word professor. And I re and I and I reprompted a few times, and you just get so many white dudes with glasses. You have to exactly. have glasses, apparently, and often you're in a lab coat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, we've space for a bit of questions, and Rima, we'll we'll show your poem in a minute now if you've got um if you've got it queued up. Um, but any questions for Mel? Yeah, someone asked me, can we consider systematic review studies as original research articles, especially when submitting to a journal? Absolutely. Absolutely. They, it is original research, even though it's, a, it's what's called secondary research, simply because you are synthesizing primary research studies that have already been undertaken. 
Um, but there are so many uh, journals that specialise in evidence synthesis, uh, especially um, in education. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe for I'll example, the one you're editor of, what's that called again? Oh yeah. Um, so uh, from January, I'll be an editor of the Review of Education uh, journal, um, which does publish both primary and secondary research. Um, but there's also, for example the new nordic journal of systematic reviews and mm -hmm. education uh, that started i'll pop a few others in the in the chat as well excellent shameless plugging excellent <laughs> so so anyone want to come in by mic or chat and when i'm doing that while i while i'm waiting for giving you a, a bit of space to do that i'm going to just share some information about the eden annual conference which is coming up in graz in june 2024 the call for papers has just been announced i'll just share that in the chat there um and the the uh the submission is not till after christmas so we have one there in the chat for you what about review studies what kind of studies should we consider i'm not sure i understand the question so if you could just perhaps um reword the question i'd be happy to answer and we have another one please suggest some good journals except free literature reviewer papers <laughs> okay i'm not that, that's another one I'm not too sure about the answer I'll, I'll 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 let you have a go engine oh yeah let me let me give you the mic engine and maybe I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name as well apologies in advance and you can yeah. thank you us. so much for great presentation Melissa uh, I am Engin I am Engin Pursun uh, my question is uh, in the when you're submitting your uh, article to journal there's uh, different kind of journal, original article, review studies. How should we consider uh, for the review studies? What kind of studies um, we should consider for the review studies? Because there is a section when you submit your uh, type of article that you uh, prepare. Um, what kind of studies should we consider for the review studies? OK. Ah, I, OK. The category. Okay. Yeah, yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. So a review it would be for me any form of the the review family slide that I had up there just before. Any form of evidence synthesis um, would be a, a review, absolutely. Um, as long as it's a it is a a study that has used is synthesizing primary research um, and synthesis. Sorry, I've got a cat that's trying to get into the picture here. Um, as long as it is, uh, yeah, a, 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 stu a review that is synthesizing the uh, results or the information about primary research that's been conducted before, that is a form of evidence synthesis. So that would be if you want to check that review box when you're submitting to a journal. But not all journals have that as an option. You just pop it in and, and they figure out whether it's a, um, a primary or a secondary article. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another one here for you, Mel, I'm thinking. Could you suggest steps to begin the literature review? Sometimes it's overwhelming not knowing where to start. In brief, please, because Mel could talk for like 10 days about that. Absolutely true. Um, yeah, okay. So the very first place you should start is to do a search for reviews that already exist. Have a look and see if you can find something on the topic that you're, um, that you're researching. Um, see how they've done it. Look at their methods. Look at their results. And then try and come up with a way that you could differentiate, maybe fill a gap that they didn't fill. That is the best place to start. Good stuff. And two more. Uh, can you tell a little bit more about the screening process? So inclusion, exclusion, I'm, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at the beginning of your um, evidence synthesis process, you would choose which, uh, which types of research are going to be included. So ones that you're focused on and that you will be synthesizing and what are the exclusion criteria that you couldn't possibly have um, to answer your research question. Um, when you're doing, first of all, you would screen all of the items on title and abstract only. You wouldn't need to look at the full text at that point. Um, and you would apply that inclusion exclusion criteria to um, all, of the, all of the items that you found. Once you have um, done all of that, you would then uh, screen all of the included items on title and abstract on full text. Um, but perhaps I can chat, chat, uh, type some of this information uh, into the chat um, so that uh, we can hear again from Rima. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, any more questions? I just answered one. A good way to organize resources. So so Mel has shared a load of different tools there. Epi is probably the one you like. Um, Excel, lots of different tools. Yeah, there are a lot of yeah, there are a lot of different tools. Um, I prefer like I mean I am biased. Uh, but uh, I was using Epi Review long before I worked at Epicenter. Um, I prefer a a software that can can manage all the processes for me in the one spot. Um. That's why I prefer Epi Review. But Rayan is a, is a great free tool um, that supports mainly the searching, deduplication, and screening stages. Not so much with the data extraction stage. Um, Covidence. Yeah. One of my students is using Covidence and is oh yeah, Covidence enjoying is it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll pop I'll pop a couple of links uh, uh, to uh, I've got a preprint of a paper about the digital evidence synthesis tools that exist and how they can be used. I'll pop that in the chat. Okay. Um. So there's 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 more questions there. Focus of SOR is the method, not the search strategy. No, that is not accurate. Again, uh, I could continue talking. Don't, don't um, get her started. <laughs> <laughs> I'll type some things in the chat. Okay. Um. Thanks to Mel and Rima. Um. I think we'll get Rima to play her poem if you have a cute, the beautiful. Uh, I do, but I'm not going to play the whole uh, video. I'll just bit. play the poem. It's okay. a beautiful video as well. Thank you. And it might give us a little bit of an idea of what like the weaving entails and how it's different from other forms of, uh, of art and how it allowed me to understand certain things in a different way. Um, uh, these are two examples of... Uh, of found poems. I just want to show you the one to the left, which is Jasmine's found poem and how I played a little bit with the formatting to express how she was talking at the time of uh, uh, of doing that. This is another poem for every uh, uh, for every part of my research. I wrote a poem and this was the final one. Selvage to selvage is the edge of the tapestry. And uh, because art is unfinished, I left my tapestry unfinished, which is finished, but it's unfinished as well. And uh, as I said, it's a reflection of how I will continue my research. Um, and for me, I wrote something that I called a mirrored poem. It hinges uh, in the middle line. Uh, so it's kind of like mirrored. Uh, and the word in the middle line that is yarn it means yarn as in yarn and yarn as in story as well here it is oh let me just unshare and share again to make sure that i'm sharing sound yeah i wasn't sharing sound yeah work away reva all good there's lots okay. of activity in the chat anyway people are busy <laughs> I think I should be sharing sound, but if you don't hear my sound immediately, let me know. A guided thread of colored weft, from left to right, from right to left, a sense of self at depth to see. I wonder if there'll ever be a tale to tell a work of art from my head, hand and heart. With every strand, a symphony of stories sung in harmony. A creation comes alive. When I struggle to survive, I weave a yarn that never ends. But when I struggle to survive, a creation comes alive. Of stories sung in harmony. With every strand, a symphony from my head, hand and heart. A tale to tell, a work of art. I wonder if there'll ever be a sense of self at depth to see, from left to right, from right to left. I guide a thread of colored weft. You don't want to hear the song, do you? <laughs> no, I think that's good, uh, uh, Rima. I love that video, though. It's beautiful. Thank you. I love the combination of the poetry and the weaving. It's fantastic. Um, 
So I think I'm going to bring the session to a close in a moment. And, and first of all, say th a huge thanks to Rima and Melissa for sharing their work. Um, I think it's really interesting stuff. And one of the things I'm really passionate about is actually showing the research process. I don't think we do that enough. Uh, and I think uh, how, how, how can we help other researchers learn about research if we don't actually talk about the messy middle bit, which is messy and does involve creativity um, and trying out different tools and different methods um, and and including different different ways of thinking like Rima's work with her art and her weaving uh, in the process. Um, so I think it's 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 great to to do that, to look inside the tin, make our research more tra uh, transparent and help other people uh, learn more about how to do these these this work. So thank you very much, Melissa and Rima. It's been fantastic. And thank you everyone for coming along. Uh, the recordings and uh, et cetera will be on the Eden website in the next few days. So thank you.